Hillman students. Today we are going to start our next mini unit on communication. And if you have not already, be sure to open up your communication notes on Canvas. That way you can fill in your notes as we go through the PowerPoint. And to help you out, I have highlighted the words in the PowerPoint that you will need to fill in on your notes. And they should be showing up highlighted on your notes as well. So hopefully it's going to stand out a little bit easier for you to get your notes filled in. So if you need to, go ahead and pause this video, get those notes out, and then when you're ready to move on, we can start playing the video again. Okay. So when we talk about communication with preschool aged kids, we are going to start looking at the four types of vocabulary development. And we know the four types of vocabulary development are listening, speaking, reading, and writing. We know that listening is important because these would be um, words we're understanding when we hear them. Because that's the thing with three to five year olds. Much can be said, but how much are they truly actually understanding? So it's one thing to hear words, it's another to be able to to listen in and actually know what those words mean. Speaking would be words we use when we speak, which is kind of interesting because kids can use words and they might not know what the definition of those words would be. Um, so we do need to be mindful that yes, they might use those words, but do they truly understand the meaning? So we'd want to make sure um, we observe kids, we get to know them to really be able to determine um, do they know what those words are or are they just using them because they've heard them used but they don't actually know what they mean. Then we have reading, and reading would be words we understand when we read them. So it kind of goes back with listening and speaking. Kids could be able to, to just rattle off sight words or see books and look, I know that word, and okay, that's great, they can recognize that word, but do they know what it actually means? Because that would be the goal. Otherwise, reading is kind of, I don't know, it's not as meaningful for them if it's just empty words on a page. And then we have writing. Writing will be words we use in our writing. So all four of these things are going to build off of one another and help our preschool age friends with their communication development. Communication with three to five year olds. So let's say that we're trying to have a conversation with a three to five year old child. When we're talking to them, maybe we're, we're asking them a question or we're giving them a prompt of some kind. We want to make sure that we're giving them time to respond because their brains, remember, are still making many, many connections and they're still getting wired. And they're going to need some time to put some answers together to then speak back to us. So don't be surprised if you say something to them and you get a pause. That would be completely normal. Now, if the pause goes on for too long, then we need to start thinking about what did we say to them? Um, did it make sense? Are they understanding what we're saying? Um, because that might be the reason why we're not getting a response. So one thing we can do is we could ask the child an open-ended question, um, or sorry, <laughs> instead of asking them an open-ended question, ask them a yes or no question. So an example of that would be, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? That would be very open-ended. It's very broad. Um, there are so many answer possibilities. And that might be a little overwhelming for them. Versus if I stick with a yes or no question like, hey, do you like ice cream? Well, now they can simply answer yes or no. And if they were to say yes, then maybe I continue on with my yes or no questions by asking, do you like chocolate ice cream? Do you like vanilla ice cream? Do you like cookie dough ice cream? And I could go on and on and on, um, but maybe my chances of getting a response will be better because it is simple yes or no. Another thing I can do is talk with the children while they're actually playing. So maybe they're in the dramatic play center, maybe they're at the art center creating a picture, maybe they're outside on the swings, swinging away. Anytime they're in moments of play, they tend to be a little bit more comfortable and they might just start 
talking more freely back to you in those moments of conversation versus if I were to just sit them down at a desk and chair and just start asking them a bunch of questions. Well, now it's kind of like you actually put them in a hot seat, like literally. Um, and that might be a little stressful for them. So try talking to them while they're playing and see if those responses will flow a little bit more freer. And then another thing I can do is rephrase my questions. Maybe maybe how I asked it, maybe the words I was using, they're just not making sense to that child. So maybe I need to simplify what it is that I'm trying to say to them in order to initiate a response. So these would all be things I can try when I am communicating and having those conversations with kids. One idea that we can use with kids to help with their vocabulary development would be to use what's called alliteration. And I'm pretty sure you've come across this word in your English classes. So alliteration is words that begin with the same sound, the same sound. Please note the difference. This is the same sound. We are not talking about rhyming words here. Okay. Rhyming is rhyming. We're talking alliteration. So some examples here, we have six, six, sisters selling shiny shoes. S, 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 S. Words that begin with the same sound. Okay. Crawl like a creepy crawly caterpillar. K, 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 K. Jump like jolly jumping beans. J, J, J. Anytime we can help them with those sounds, it's going to help with their word formations when they go to speak them. And then also it's going to help them in identifying words when they're hearing and listening for them. So alliteration can be pretty powerful. And that's why a lot of times you hear a lot of preschool and kindergarten age kids where they'll do things like eh, apple, b, ball, k, cat, d, dog. Like they'll do some kind of like starting sound before they actually say the word. So it's, it's a simple technique, but it definitely has its, its strengths. Okay. Then we have stages of writing. So stages of writing with kids is we notice that, yep, usually they're learning to write their names first and that'll be some of the first writing they do. And we'll see them go through a couple of different stages as they're learning to write their name. And the first stage is going to be scribbling. They're going to scribble on a piece of paper and they're going to say, look, I wrote my name. And we as adults are going to look at it and think that looks nothing like your name. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't, it scribbles. But it's interesting how their brain is perceiving, yeah, I wrote it. I wrote some letters. Um, so for example, in this picture, this child where the arrow is pointing, that's their letter O. Well, to them it makes sense, but to us it makes no sense. So we just have to kind of go with it that scribbling, yes, is going to be that first stage. Second stage we're going to see them go with is identifying letters and then actually using letters from their name. So we might have them write some random letters on paper and they might be able to identify like, yeah, that's a letter that goes in my name, um, but it's not going to be in the right order. It's not going to look exactly like how letters should look. So it's something we just have to remember. They're going through these stages and we give them time to develop it. And I love these pictures here because this is the same child. Look at the difference between September when they're recognizing letters and they're trying to write them compared to now they're, they've had more practice and a more opportunity to try writing these, these letters and get their name right. And that's a lot of growth just from September to February. So you can definitely see the difference of identifying letters and using them versus, okay, now we're getting something that looks a little bit more like their name which is then part of the third step. So we know that they're going to write their name in ways that others can recognize, but it's not gonna be perfect, okay? We should not expect perfection yet because again, these things are gonna take time. So I love the examples here because if I look at Ella's name, Ella has her A backwards, which is something that is very common with kids. They, they can get letters backwards. Um, Bethany, she's done pretty good, but just looking at her A, the stem is a little too long. Um, and then the N, do I feel sneeze? <coughs> you, yes, yeah, excuse me. Um, and then the end, she's missing a part of the stem on the end. So we can see that it's her name. We just know that it's not perfect. 
Eliza, she's got her A backwards, but then also look at how she did her eye. She has the dot right on top of the, the stem of the eye. Um, Finley does that right now too, where she just puts the dot right on top. So eventually they'll have some space in there, but again, it just takes time and practice. Spencer just has his S and P. So that might be where he's comfortable right now. And that's totally fine. And then going back up to Brandis, I love what Brandis is doing here because oftentimes it gets overlooked, but yet we shouldn't overlook it because it's pretty clever problem solving. So notice how Brandis has a really long name. It's pretty long. When you think of a three to five year old having to write this on a note card, that's not a lot of space. Well, what's interesting is Brandis runs out of space She's got her E and then she's got her I. Ah, she can't fit the S. So she puts it down in the next line. That's really fascinating because when kids start reading, they have to learn, okay, here's this line. Now I go to the next line and I go to the next line and it's going to go from left to right. So whether she did it purposefully or not, it'd be interesting to find out because that was just, like I said, it's really good problem solving on her part. All right, then we have the last stage of writing, which is going to be mastery of writing their name. So I can see with Henry's name, all of these letters, they're written in the way that they're supposed to be, like the H is an H, the E is an E. There's no parts missing. There's no letters switched around. There's no letters backwards. Um, Henry did a very good job writing his name. Now, I love this one because it's, again, um, kind of a time lapse. Like this is how Ella was writing her name before. And now look at how she's writing her name now. So up above, this would be, yeah, she's, she's using letters and she's recognizing ones that go under her name, but it's definitely not perfect. So the E has way too many lines. The L is upside down. Um, we can tell that Ella has written her name, but it's definitely not perfect. Whereas now in this card, the letters are looking as they should. And then this would be considered mastery of her name. Reading to kids, we should be reading to children every single day. And that doesn't mean it takes a lot of time. Really on average, 15 to 30 minutes a day, that's all it takes. So if you think of reading kids books for this age group, you're looking at anywhere between like, I don't know, three or four up to like eight or 10 children's books a day. That's not a lot. And the thing is, is that it does not have to be done all in one sitting. So for example, maybe kids get up in the morning, they go to their daycare or their preschool center, they have large group story time, and they read two books. Okay, well maybe that was like five minutes right there. And then maybe at nap time, they read another one or two books. Okay, maybe that's another five minutes at least right there. Then maybe they get home at night and part of their bedtime routine is we get to read two or three books before we go to bed. Okay, well that's gonna be at least five minutes right there. You're already up to 15. It's just little chunks throughout the day. Now, could you do all of that in one sitting? Yes. Can you break it up? Yes. Um, the important thing again is that we're reading to kids each day. And the reason we want to do this is because science and data backs us up that reading is so important for kids and their cognitive and their communication skill development. So there's, there's a lot of good things um, that tend to result because of that reading happening. Another thing we can do to help children with their reading and communication skills is give them print-rich spaces. So spaces that they can be in day in and day out that are going to allow them to continue their vocabulary development. Now, this one's an obvious one because it's an actual reading center within their preschool. So yeah, having books available for them to look at, even if they can't read the words, they're still being exposed to them, and that's a really big deal but it's not all about books, okay? So I love these two pictures. We have a preschool center and then we have an in-home center. Um, but just looking around the spaces, I see the letter carpets where kids can sit on their, like their carpet square. So I am sitting on the L for lion today, or I'm on the J today. There's letter association with that in where they actually sit for story time or any other large group activity. Um, if I look at the picture on the left, I can see that there's a weather um, 
bulletin board. I can see that there's a calendar. I can see that there's a daily schedule posted. All of those things are print rich because it's exposing the kids to words, numbers, um, days of the week, months of the year, what the weather is actually like outside. I can also see that they have a poster of different shapes like a sphere, a cone, a cube. Um, all of that is going to be print rich. The picture on the right I'm loving because they have have some very similar things but then they also have the drawers labeled with pictures so the kids know what is supposed to go into each drawer so that just on its own is going to be print rich in the space Another thing we can do in print rich spaces that's very common is having the daily duties or the weekly jobs where I have it posted. So I have line leader, caboose, door holder, all of that stuff. It's the word. It's a picture so the kids are able to identify what that word is because let's be real, three to five year olds, they're not going to be able to read all those words. But if they see the picture, then they can understand, oh yeah, that's going to be the job. And then what's cool is these popsicle sticks have their pictures, but then lower on the popsicle stick is actually their name as well. So they get to see their names. They know it's their name because they see their picture and that's providing print rich material. Another thing would be kind of like what that other picture had was just their daily schedule. So the words are written, but then there's a picture so they can understand what those words actually mean in the event they can't read them. So great examples of things that would already be posted that are print rich. Another thing that we see happen in our preschool and especially our kindergarten rooms too, and I'm going to take a bet. Some of you have had this even happen in your foreign language classes, um, but anytime you're learning a language, you could do a word wall. So this is an example of a word wall where they have the letters of the alphabet, and as the children are learning words, they put them underneath the letter of the alphabet. We Warriors started doing word walls, oh, a couple years ago, and they always started their word wall with the children's names. So for example, under F, Finley would have had her name listed here. And then the other children would have their names listed so they can identify there's my name, that's the letter it starts with. Um, and then as they go, they would add more words to the wall like cat, dog, hat. Um, maybe it's even the months of the year like November, October. Maybe it's holidays like Veterans Day, Halloween, whatever the case might be, they can add it to that word wall and now they've got a really great print rich space. Other things we can do in a space, especially with time, because we know after talking about logical thinking concepts, time is such a hard one for kids to understand. So what we could do is, yes, we have a clock in the room, but then we can post pictures of what clocks look like when it's time for certain parts of the day, like lunch, recess, related arts, when they go home, when it's rest time. And then they can compare the clock to the actual clock that's keeping time. And then that can be something they refer back to so they know when things are coming up. Another thing we can do in our spaces is just label things. So if we have a bulletin board, put the word bulletin board on it. If we have a desk, put the word desk on it. If we have a bottle of glue, put the word glue on it. If we have a door, put the word door. Um, just have labels on things and the kids are going to be exposed to that when they see those items and objects and structures within the space. Another thing we can do is label any of our um, books. We could label any of our bins again. So again, having the word, but then also having the picture to go with it, that's a pretty powerful thing. So just more examples of what we can do to make a, a space print rich. Okay, so this is where I'm going to set you loose. I am going to have you find print rich things in your home space. So we're obviously all at home right now, and I'm just curious to see what you would be able to find in your home space that would be considered print rich. Now, obviously, you're not just stuck in your your own like sleeping space you can use any space that is within your home space or you could even like walk around your yard or outside of your home space and see if you can find some print rich items so to make it a little bit more challenging i want you to find um all of the letters of the alphabet 
okay? Words that you are seeing throughout your space that you're like, oh yeah, that starts with this letter and voila, you have found something print rich, okay? So I want you to document where are you finding these things? What are you finding? Um, and then write those down and then see, can you actually find all 26 letters? Or did you have some that you just weren't able to find? Because the reality is you might not be able to find all of them and that's okay. But I'm going to guess you can probably find more of them than you think you might be able to. So here's an example. I found this picture of a microwave. It is an LG brand microwave. Now, if it's something like that where it's LG, okay, I can use the microwave for the letter L in the alphabet or I can use it for the letter G in the alphabet, but I cannot use it for both. You're older than three to five year olds, so you need a little bit more of a challenge, okay? <laughs> um, but let's say you have a poster in your bedroom. Okay, well, take one of the words off that poster and use it towards your letters of the alphabet, but then you're done with that poster. So if it's a poster that has tons and tons of words on it, yeah, no repeats. You can't use that poster for more than one thing. So choose your words and letters wisely, okay? So see what you're able to find. And at this time, if you need to log off to do this, yeah, you should log off. That way you can be a little bit more mobile and free to go find all of these wonderful print-rich things within your home space. So again, document what you're finding, and I'm so excited to see what you come up with. And have a great rest of your day, everyone.